Thanks, Brent. Thank you, thank you. Honestly, uh, I stand beside Brian, I feel short. <laughs> you know, you get a little bit older. I used to be six foot three. <laughs> Just gravity, you know, how it kind of works. You know, uh, Pastor Steve, uh, you know, he's, um, God's used him mightily uh, here in, in Albuquerque. I remember when he was in Roswell, uh, you know, how you get, how God gives, puts thoughts in your mind. I remember that there was a time when <clears throat> I, I believe that God had shown me that, uh, that he was going to go to a city surrounded by mountains. And uh, probably at a time when he was just wondering even if he was going to leave uh, Roswell. And I remember talking to him uh, when he came to Albuquerque and he said, uh, remember that word when you said that I would be in the city surrounded by mountains. And he said, here it is, it's Albuquerque. And from that moment, you see, God spoke a word, and he made it very real. And look at all that God has done since he's been here in Albuquerque. But I'm going to give you the human side of Pastor Steve. When we were in Roswell, he said, hey, he says, how about coming with me? He said, we want to pray for this little old lady. And, um, you know, she's just a nice little uh, servant of the Lord, and she's, you know, uh, and so I said, yeah, sure, let's go. So we went, and we were sitting in her living room, and uh, she had this uh, jar, of this little bowl of peanuts, and, and um, you know, he reaches over, and he's eating these peanuts, and my, he ate the whole bowl. So she came back in the room, he must have felt bad, he, you know, he said, oh, I'm sorry, you know, he said, I ate all your peanuts. She, she said, well, that's okay, funny. She said, I licked all the chocolate off of them. You could have the rest. <laughs> so that's the other side of Pastor Steve, okay? <laughs> and I was thinking about different uh, stories in the Bible. And being Jewish, I love the Old Testament. And... One of the great stories that every Jewish person knows and you learn is, is the story of how the Hebrews were freed from slavery. And they were in Egypt uh, in, in slavery for a lot of years. And at one point where God says, look, no more. Slavery is no more. And he sent a deliverer. He sent Moses. And there were plagues that came. And finally, uh, it was the death of the firstborn that Pharaoh called on his own people and the nation walked out of Egypt with all the spoils of Egypt. They walked out, uh, Egypt was in great pain, but not enough pain, they went after them and tried to uh, kill them. The armies tried to kill uh, the Hebrew people and here they're at the Red Sea and not knowing where to go and many times uh, we in our own lives feel like we're up against against it we're at the Red Sea you know and do we have a way out but God made a way and the waters parted that huge Red Sea parted and a whole nation walked over on dry land now you would think that would be significant but all through uh, the story it talks about how that nation still had a slave mentality it's like they were free physically but they were not free mentally or emotionally and so oftentimes, you know, when we approach Christianity, it's a wonderful scripture that says who God sets free is what? Free indeed. But yet, there's so many things in our minds that often take us back to, to things in our lives, and we create a narrative. We create a filter that we look through. And oftentimes, we don't even realize we're doing it. It's in our subconscious, and we kind of look, things, uh, look at things, and we might look at them through negative, negativity or fear or whatever as this nation did. But after that generation died out, 40 years, they wandered in the desert. So you have to realize that going into the promised land, the oldest person other uh, than the two leaders that were to take the nation across, the oldest people were 40. 
And so uh, they had a, an army of about 40,000 that was going ahead of them. They had, uh, they had never fought a battle. They had just prepared. And so now they're getting ready to cross over out of the desert. They're getting ready to cross over into the promised land. And God speaks to Joshua, and he says to him, look, here you are, you're at water again, but this time we're going to walk across the water again. He says, you're going to go in a place that you've never been before. I'm going to read a couple of scriptures to you, and then I'm going to tell you the story. In um, Joshua, the third chapter, it says, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you've never been this way before, but keep a distance about a thousand yards between you and the ark. Don't go near it, Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. So you have to realize that this river was at flood stage. So it was, it was a mile or more across. And as soon as the Ark of the Covenant, now the Levites are carrying the Ark, and as soon as they walk out into the water, the water starts to roll back. The scripture says it rolled back in, in a heap. And so now millions of people are going to walk over on dry land. Quite an amazing thing. So scripture goes on in the fourth chapter. It says, when the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, choose 12 men from the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, right where the priest stood, and carry them over with you and put them down at a place where you're going to stay tonight. So here the, the Levites have the ark, and you can imagine, I mean, it's probably pretty heavy. And so there's a whole bunch, you know, uh, after so many minutes, one would go ahead and take the other's position, and they're holding this thing until the entire nation crosses and passes by. And then while they're still there, and the nation crossed by, 12 men came, and I'm sure it was a contest. Who's going to get the biggest stone, you know? And so they took the stones, 12 stones, and they carried them to the other side. In the fourth chapter, the last scripture I'm going to read says, In the future, when your descendants ask their fathers, what do these stones mean? Tell them Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. And the Lord your God did to the Jordan just what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we crossed over. Now, I want you to listen to this. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and that you might always fear the Lord your God. So get the picture now. Twelve men have these stones, large stones, and they have them on their shoulder, and they take them over, and they start putting them. They put maybe four down, and then three, and three, and then until they make a, sort of a monument. And... The reason for that monument is said that when the generations ask you what happened here, you're going to tell them about the great miracles that took place. So as I read this, I started to think, memorial stones. Are there memorial stones in our lives? What do we base our narrative on? What do we base what we think about? What do we base how we make decisions? What, what do we base those things on? I mean, some have had very difficult times in your life. Some have had uh, abuse. Some have been through divorce. Some have, have been through neglect, have fearful situations. Some have felt alone. There's all kinds of reasons of why we develop certain stones that we go back and look at. So I started to think, well, what were the stones that I can tell my children about? Well, one I thought was so obvious. I said, you know what? I was Jewish. Uh, I went to a meeting that was very much different than I'd ever imagined. Things like that didn't happen in the synagogue. And I mean, it was just totally uh, culturally uh, different from anything that I'd ever experienced. And a man came out and prayed for me who did not know me, and he spoke in tongues as he was praying. And as he was praying in tongues, it was Hebrew, and it was a prayer that I had learned when I was bar mitzvahed. At first I thought, what am I hearing? I mean, is this real? And I asked him, I said, how do you know I'm Jewish? How do you know Hebrew? How do you know these things? He didn't know anything. I knew I had walked into a supernatural experience. It was something that was 
different. I couldn't explain it. It's something that my education wouldn't let me grasp a hold of. But when my parents, when my mother found out that I had accepted Jesus and she said, look, you're out. We're going to disown you. You're going to kill your father. You're going to kill your grandparents. We can't do this. How we're going to be a disgrace in the Jewish community. How could you do this? Get your clothes and leave. I'm sure she didn't mean that. But she was trying to change my thought process. And so when I left that night, I mean, I was wounded. But I was willing to go because I had a stone that was a foundational piece in the monument that I was about to build. Nobody could change that. I had a real experience. How many of you have had a real experience about Jesus? Well, if you had a real experience about it and about your faith and about Jesus, I guarantee you it's in there. It's in there. And some of the greatest shocks that I have are people that have had a real experience and then turn away. I, I, I think, wow. I start to say, well, is it really real? Or maybe is life so difficult that you look at the stones that you're building over here of fear and difficult times and that's what you see and you don't remember the stone that you built over here. The second stone that I made as a foundation was after I was kicked out and I went to Patty's house and I said, Patty, I said, gee, I said, I was just kicked out. My mother kicked me out. I got my clothes in my car, uh, you know, and I expect her to go, oh, you know, I feel so bad for you and, you know, it's just too bad and uh, just come on in and let's go out and get something to eat and, you know, oh, booby and let's kiss and make up and I'll take care of you, you know, I mean, come on. <laughs> but she says to me, I'm seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I went, the baptism of the what? She said, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I said, what's the baptism of the Holy Spirit? She says, I don't know, but I'm seeking it. <laughs> and I said, well, what is it? She says, it's some kind of other special connection with God that, that prepares you for life and all this stuff. And she didn't know, but she was seeking it because a girlfriend of hers was seeking it and spoke in tongues. And, uh, you know, and I'm thinking, my gosh, I said, I said, am I dating a crazy woman here? You know. But she had nice legs. She could have said anything. I didn't care. <laughs> so we go to this little church. And a bunch of crazy people in there had their hands up in the air, talking out loud, you know. Somebody's crying. Somebody's laughing. I mean, I never saw stuff like this before in my life. And then they're passing the offering plate around, and I put 50 bucks in it, and at the end of the service, people come forward. They're, they're up front. I said, what are, you, what, what are they doing up front? I'm back by myself. I don't want to be myself. I'm a people person. I want to be with people. But all the people were up front. So I said, well, maybe I'll go up front, you know. <laughs> so I looked around, and there wasn't anybody to go with. So I had to walk up there by myself, and I went up front. And as I was going up front, a man says to me, grabs me by the arm and says, everything's going to be okay with your mother. I said, what? And I'm thinking immediately, he talked to Patty, you know, and they had this thing planned. Uh, you know, when I walked in, when you see a guy with a mustache who has glasses, who's really great looking, <laughs> and when you see him walking up front, just reach out and grab his arm and tell him everything's going to be okay with mom, you know. And I figured, oh, you know, she, they had this all planned. And then this other guy comes up to me, a little guy, little tiny guy with a gruff voice. He goes, brother, <laughs> brother, you have the power of God in your life. <laughs> well, by that time, I mean, I was invested. I, I have 50 bucks invested in this thing. I'm invested. <laughs> I mean, I want my money's worth now. I'm invested. I want the power of God. I paid for it. I want the power of God. Okay. You want the power of God? Next thing you know, I'm laying on the floor. And I'm talking some kind of gibberish, a language I never studied. i talking this thing, and, you know, I feel like, Gee, I'm on the floor, but I can't get up. And I'm laying on a dirty floor. Who knows who walked on that floor? There could have been people in their bare feet on that floor. I don't know.
But I'm on that floor, and it was another foundational stone. It was like another stone in that monument. Then my mother has a dream, and she comes back, and she says, you know what? She says, I, I didn't mean any of that, that, uh, you know, you're not my son and any of that. She says, I can't believe what you believe. She said, but you've been a good son. And I mean, I'm thinking, oh, my gosh. Amazing. Then my father, who was dying at the time, had cancer. And I remember it was a year later that I was speaking, July 4th, 1976, and I was speaking in front of thousands of people at the Penn State Fieldhouse on America for Jesus. And that night was the first real time that I'd really heard the voice of God. And it was a thought that came to me so strong about go down, lay hands upon your father, I'm going to heal him tonight. And I walked down and went up to my dad and I said, Dad, Jesus wants to heal you tonight. I mean, my Jewish dad, I don't know what he's going to say. I mean, it was a miracle he was there in the first place. I mean, his, his reason for going is I wanted to hear my son speak before I die. And so when I said to him, Jesus wants to heal you tonight, my dad bowed his head. And he started to cry. And I remember that prayer. And it was just a few days later, he was at the Cleveland Clinic. My mother called. And they couldn't find a trace of cancer in his body. There's another stone that was down on the foundation. One that God saves. One that God gives you a, a, a power beyond something that you can imagine that can sustain you and carry you for life as crazy as it is. Believe me, you know, when you have a doctorate and, and you start talking a language that you never studied and you don't know what it is, it, sometimes it doesn't seem logical. It's not... I mean, you think, oh, it's stupid. I mean, what am I doing here? Listen, when you have a PhD in psychology, I already diagnosed myself as crazy. So it's not a problem. <laughs> and so, you know, now God heals my dad. So that means God can heal. God can do a miracle. I mean, this is in the new days of Christianity. It's a stone. Then I get hooked up with a guy named Bill Bear. Has a foundation, took kids in his home. He wasn't very educated, but he loved kids, and he started uh, this nonprofit, and he asked if I would come and help him, and I really didn't want to do it. I was busy and things about my life. And, you know, when you don't want to do something, all you have to say is, I'll pray about it, okay? <laughs> Are you with me? Come, hey, this is, this is Sandy. You can talk to me. I know you do it. You know. And so you say, you know, uh, I'll pray about it. So, but I really did pray about it. And as I was praying, there was a thought that came to me about if you take care of these kids, I'll take care of your kids. The thing is, I didn't have any kids. And I had a little girl to Patty's first marriage that I couldn't adopt because her deadbeat dad wouldn't let me do it. And so right after I said, okay, uh, you know, I'll, I'll help you because uh, maybe some selfish reasons here that, okay, I believe that God will help me here with a family. And lo and behold, they find deadbeat dad, and next thing you know, I'm adopting my oldest daughter because he didn't want to pay support. And listen, I, I can't believe what a deal. I, I bought my oldest daughter. I mean, it was such a good deal. <laughs> you know, and not only that, I got a grandson out of it, too. I mean, it's just amazing, the deal. I mean, great gal, great daughter. That's my first kid. Patty couldn't have children. Next thing you know, uh, you know, she goes and she goes in and has, finds out that she doesn't need a hysterectomy because God spoke in a dream and said, look, um, you know, he showed me an, an old man holding a baby. And there I said to her, you know, I think we're going to have children. She said, I'm not going to have a hysterectomy. Next thing you know, they find out it wasn't really what she needed. It was something from a previous surgery. A few months later, she's pregnant because I work fast. I don't fool around. <laughs> And out popped a little boy. And a year later, out popped a little girl. Now I have kids. Take care of these kids. I'll take care of yours. And so now I have another stone here about how God can speak a, in a dream and how if you believe that and have faith, how he can give you family. And I don't, it's amazing how many 
people that I've prayed for that have been barren that have had children. Now, if you don't, now if you're older in life and you don't want me to pray for you, that's okay. You know, I, I mean, but you know, it's it, it's it's a stone. I'm going to give you another stone because I, I, I was praying for Pastor Steve and Cynthia's granddaughter, and a thought came to me because she she wants a horse and a pig. Okay, horse and a pig. Give me a break. I mean, they they got a backyard as big as a stamp. You know. And not a little pig, a big pig. So I, so I told her a story. I said, you know, my daughter Colleen, you know, she wanted a dog. We didn't want a dog, dog to pee on carpet, stuff like that. We had a new carpet. We didn't want a dog. So we said, what kind of dog do you want? She said, I want a miniature Shih Tzu. I never even heard of a Shih Tzu. And I said, oh, you know what? I said, if God gives you a dog, she said, I said, how big is that? I said, it can't be a big dog. She says, no, just a little dog. It's okay. It's, it's as long as it's a little dog. And I said, I don't want to spend any more than 75 bucks. That's it. Well, this little kid prays. Next thing you know, somebody tells my wife that they had a litter of miniature Shih Tzus. And for 75 bucks, we can have one. <laughs> She's going to get a pig because I told her that story. You know that. I mean, I can't believe. So there was a, another stone here that don't let your daughter pray when you're praying differently. <laughs> Kids have more faith than you. So there's another stone there. And then the dog, we get the dog. The dog's a little tiny, little tiny thing. I used to put it in my shoe. That's how small it was. And so the dog's running through the kitchen, and we have a swing door, door close on the dog's head, dog's dead. Boom. <laughs> Serves her right for praying for a dog <laughs> against my wishes. <laughs> so then I pick up the dog and she says, Daddy, pray for the dog. Pray for the dog. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, oh my gosh. How do I pray for this dog? The dog's dead. It's turned. Blood coming out the ear. <clears throat> I take it to the dog doctor. What do I do? Dig a hole, put it in a shoebox, take a little cross. So I said, okay, I'll pray. And so we started to pray, and she's praying, and I'm praying. And the dog jumps up out of my hands. <laughs> and the dog starts to run around the house. Daughter's running after the dog. Wife's running after the daughter. I mean, it's a stone. Now i got another stone here that God can heal an animal. Hey, I got another one because it's in the middle of winter in Pennsylvania. It's cold, and you know, furnaces never go out uh, during the week. Furnaces only go out on the weekend when you have to pay more money, right? And being Jewish, that is really a problem for me. I mean, I think we just need to stay cold for the weekend and somebody come on Monday, right? So, so my wife says, she says, hey, look what happened to the dog. Go down and pray for the furnace. I'm thinking, oh, you've got to be nuts. I'm not going to go pray for a furnace. So I walked out. She says, go on, go pray for the furnace. So I walk down. I go, I look at the furnace, you know. I go to pray for the furnace. Next thing you know, I start walking toward the furnace, and the furnace goes, <laughs> And I look in there, and the burner's lit, and the furnace is on. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, this is worth big money here. There's another stone that I have here that you can pray and God can heal a furnace. He can heal a car. He can heal all kinds of things. A stone. Then I have two other kids, Ashley, Mitchell. So Ashley falls out of a third-story window. She's four years old. We're in Boston. Third story, it's about as high as this roof here, you know. I talked to a fireman. He said, your daughter lived? I said, yeah, she lived. Stone. I'm down in Georgia. 
And a voice speaks to me in a dream and says, you know, I saved your daughter for the children not yet born from her body. These voices that come in a dream. I don't know if it ever happens to you. Eat more pizza. It'll happen to you. <laughs> 31 years from the time God spoke to me in that dream that she was going to have a baby. It took 31 years for her and out popped Sophie. 31 years. And let me tell you something. What attack she had on her female organs. Endometriosis. I mean, I can tell you there's some painful things that happened to my daughter as a dad, believe me, that I don't even want to talk about. I mean, there's been an attack on her reproductive system. Yet God said a baby was coming. Another stone. A stone that God can speak to you in a dream. A stone that God can provide uh, uh, out of the uh, impossible. He can bring life out of the impossible. Stones. Memorial stones. You know, I always had a trouble. I never had really a financial issue. You know, my was raised with a family who was fairly well off and was destined to do something that was good in my life because I had a mother that was a cheerleader and a father that worked hard and you know uh, when you come from the Jewish culture there's things that you're told over and over again from the time you're a child that you believe and I'll never forget I found myself after my father died and I went through a terrible estate issue and my grandfather died and I went through, we were in business together and I found myself several million dollars in debt. That's a hole that when you look into it, you don't see any bottom. It's a tunnel where there's no light. It's a massive amount of money that you have no comprehension of how you're ever gonna pay it off. It's like, it, 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 it could have been anything. It's just an impossible situation. Impossible. I remember going to church and hearing a story about a man that gave, uh, he preached a message about giving 10% of your debt. And this woman came up and gave him a check. Another person came up, gave him an IOU, you know, and he talked about all the miracles that happened as a result of that. And and we needed a massive amount of money. Uh, there were things that were going to happen. I was afraid that my mother was going to lose her home. My grandmother was going to lose her home. I was just, it was just a very terrible time. And I needed $350,000 that might have, should have been, it could have been $350 million. It didn't make much difference. It was like some astronomical amount I didn't have anyway. And so I heard, so 10% of your debt so 10% of you. So I went up, I said, hey, I'm going to give an IOU. What happens if I don't pay? What are they going to do, Sanguido? <laughs> so I gave an IOU, $35,000, having no idea how that could ever come in, if it could even be possible. But lo and behold, there was an organization that I had really helped previously, and they had closed their doors, and their board wanted to send me the balance of what they had in their checking account. I mean, just out of nowhere. I got a check for $38,500. Out of nowhere. I mean, that's like... <laughs> but that was a stone. And not only was it the 35000 but it was the tithe on the 35000 And the hardest thing I had to do was to give it away. I mean, and, and I've said this to you before, you know, and this it says, remember your vow. Shut your mouth. <laughs> remember your vow. Are you crazy? Pay your bills. Remember your vow. Nuts. Hardest thing I had to do was to write a check. Gave it. In fact, we had gone to another church, and I gave it to the new church where we had gone to, and, and it was so hard. But you know what? It was a stone that broke something financially that was over my head. It broke that curse 
that was upon me for whatever reason. It broke it. It was a stone. Now, who needed it worse? Did I need it worse or did the church need it worse? I needed it worse. But it wasn't about who needed it. It was about a plan that God had given me and a vow that I had made. And was I going to be obedient to what the vow was? And from that point on, many years ago to today, nothing has stopped my direction financially. Paid that money off, rolled past it, God opened up a door. I have the largest, I, my company, I'm a businessman who does ministry, but my company has behavioral assessments in 30-some languages that we sell all over the world. We are the largest provider of customized assessments, behavioral assessments in the world. That could never, but it had a stone on it way back when. So I'm going to ask you tonight, what are the stones that you have built in your monument? I could have built a stone of rejection. I had rejection from people, rejection from somebody I loved. I could have had a stone of fear. Because if you take a, a chance and you lose or you make a decision that's wrong and you don't want to go through that again, then you have a stone there that says, hey, look at that stone. It's fearful. Don't do it. I don't know what stones that you placed there, what's on your foundation. But whatever it was, once Jesus can come into your world, he can take and give you stones of a different kind. Are you ready? A little music? Wow. It's back to the oldies there. Seriously, what's the foundation? What have you made your stones? You made a nice base. What are they there? Are they stones of anger from divorce, stones of embitterness from rejection from a parent, stones of failure? But tonight, I want to say something with you. When I look at that monument of stones that I took from where the ark was, because the time I met Jesus, I walked into the presence of God. It was like when I met the Ark of the Covenant there, the stones where, they, where that spirit of God rested. And I can go back, even when I'm in a bad place, and believe me, I've been in plenty of them, I can go back and I can remember the memorial stones that I have, and they will carry you through. Look, I want to tell you something. I did not raise good Christians. But I raise great people. I have children that love us. I have children that are honest, generous, have good values. I have children that anybody would be proud of. But when I look at them as a Christian, I am fearful for their souls. My oldest daughter, not so much. She has a son and it's forced her to pray. But you know what? I'd love her to be in church regularly, but she doesn't do it. My son says, well, there's many ways to God. Jesus is only one. My daughter has been wounded because of things that happened to her, terrible things that had happened to her. If you've ever been raped, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So there's, there's hurts, and they've built monuments. But you know what? I can't wait to tell my daughter. I tell her over and over again. I said... Ashley, remember, 
31 years ago, God said you were going to have a baby. You said you could never have a child, and look, you have a baby. And that baby is just as healthy and as cute and as wonderful. And I never for Let me tell you something. They were home for Christmas. I forgot. I forgot how a baby will take over your world. There's baby stuff everywhere. And you work your schedule around when the baby eats and when the baby sleeps. And I can't wait to take that little Sophie and tell her when she gets a little older about how God, I'm a stone, I'm going to take that stone and I'm going to say, Sophie, here's a stone because you know what? Your mommy couldn't have a baby and, and, and she fell out of a window and she should have died, but she didn't and God preserved her life for you and for the next one that's coming. And when somebody talks to me about their business and they talk to me about financial things and I go into a company, I am fearless when it comes to money. Fearless. Because I have a stone that says, look, this is the way it works. And God is a provider of finances and God is a giver. I have a stone that says that. I have a stone that says God heals cancer. And when my wife was told that she had ductal carcinoma and it was a terrible thing and we, she told me on a Saturday morning and I, 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 I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say. But it happens to other people. It doesn't happen to us. And she's now 18 years a cancer survivor. Because there's a stone there that says God heals cancer. And when I pray for you, and I talk to you, and you come up and you tell me, you say, well, there's cancer. Hey, you got no doubt coming from me. I know God heals. I know. I've seen God take legs that were deformed and straighten them. I've watched it in front of my eyes. Nobody can tell me God doesn't heal. Nobody can tell me God doesn't provide. Nobody can tell me that God doesn't want your relationships together. Nobody can tell me that, that God, uh, uh, you know, uh, doesn't want the best for you. Nobody. I have a pillar of stones that tells me that. And tonight, I'm going to pray that you kind of rearrange your pillar here. Rearrange it a little bit. And when you walk out of here tonight, that you're going to say, I know that God loves me. I know that he's for me. And I am going to rearrange my pillar of stones for the generation that's going to ask me, what happened here? What does this mean? And I'm going to be able to tell them what God has done. I want you to say this with me. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe He died on a cross and suffered for me. I believe that he paid the penalty for my sin. He went into hell. He deposited it. And he came out three days later victorious for me so that I would never have to go to hell. I believe God is a healer. I believe every whipping that went across his back was for a disease, a sickness that can be healed by faith in him. I believe that if I sow seed, that God will provide a harvest for me. That if I need money, I give money, God provides. I believe that if I give relationship, God will cement my relationships and he will provide. I believe that God is a giver. I believe that Jesus Christ lives inside of me. I believe that he's developing the memorial stones in my life. Now, if you believe that, I want you to stand to your feet and praise God.